Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session. Welcome to today's Bridge series, a conversation where we discuss urban challenges in Lagos and Nigeria at large. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for being with us today. Um, I'm Yimika Koya, and I'm an associate of Lagos Urban Development Initiative, an organization that brings like-minded people together um, to advocate for a more inclusive, livable, and sustainable Lagos through collaboration, research, and dialogue. So again, thank you very, very much for being here with us today. So today's Bridge series is around the topic of community involvement. And we know that the topic of community participation is extremely broad and it bridges a lot of different project types. But today we really want to focus on community participation for social, environmental and political agendas in economic, in emerging economies. So our first speaker of the day is Papa Amotayo. He is an award-winning architect, designer, writer and filmmaker. Papa's work strongly focuses on exploring the nature of culture and the context within contemporary Nigeria and the extended African condition, locally and globally. He's a really strong believer in creating work through cross-disciplinary collaborations and participation. He strives to find new possibilities for creating nuanced visual narratives in Nigeria's urban centers and beyond. He is also the founder of a white space creative agency and the creative director of Mo and Art Architecture. He currently lives and works in Lagos, Nigeria. So thank you very much for being here with us, Papa. And we really look forward to your presentation today. And us and our second hold, our second speaker is Sarah Adikmi James. Um, she's a lawyer, a policy analyst, a political enthusiast, and a development expert community organizer, and a strategy consultant for nonprofit organizations. She currently works as a policy director at Shift Nigeria and is a team lead at Make Change Nigeria, an initiative of Shift Nigeria. She is most passionate about good governance, advocating for women in policies, politics, and community engagement. Through Make Change Nigeria, communities with dire infrastructural needs are empowered orientated, aided, and rescued, rescued from internet infrastructural deficits. Most recently, Sarah led a team that provided sustainable clean water for the Aliade community. And please, Sarah, you have to correct me if I'm getting that pronunciation of the community wrong. Um, the community is in Benway State. Prior to the intervention, the community had no access to clean water and was dealing with a life cleaning outbreak of water related diseases. So she's also worked with various communities all across Nigeria. And again, just thank you to both Sarah and Papa for being here with us. Um, yeah, let's kick off today's bridge series. So Papa, would you like to share your screen? Uh, hey, hi everyone. Um, I'm gonna share my screen, um, but I'm gonna be, can somebody, um, it says host of disabled participants screen share. There's actually two papas, so I mean, you may have to. Um, because for some reason I couldn't get audio from the place I'm sharing my screen, so I'm using my phone as well. I don't know, can somebody give me access to share my screen? It says it's disabled right now. Hello? Yes, Papa, you are the co-host, you're a co-host. No, no, I, there's two Papa, okay, fantastic. Great, appreciate you. Um, let me know when you can see my screen. Can anyone see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, great, great. Okay, um, how long do I have? 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Okay, this is, this is going to be fast. Okay, so thank you all. Thanks for the intro. Um, uh, thanks for everybody that's here. 
Um, I, I think I'm just going to, I've just been asked to talk specifically about a project um, that, that and an organization that came about through uh, what I call, I guess it's a, something that is part of community participation. Um, I'm going to just switch through some slides so as, as people can see me. So about, I think it was about September last year, I woke up and I came across like these men cutting down uh, these trees on what is uh, a road called Latif Jaconde in a uh, uh, residential neighborhood. And um, I don't, I live and work not too far from here. So, you know, I've, I've seen how, I know these trees, I know how old they are. And from there, um, from, so I think that happened, I can't remember what day in September, but within like one week, uh, we had managed to sort of groundswell uh, through a network of predominantly what I like to call the tree aunties, uh, like elderly uh, women that lived in the neighborhood, managed to raise a petition of thousands of signatures, um, and we had managed to um, activate the residents association to demand uh, a meeting with um, all the residents and the stakeholders. And, I, and what, I, what myself and the group tried to do was to put, put a quick presentation to them to really just, you know, at this point, um, explain to, you know, everybody what was kind of happening, you know, and just kind of highlight, you know, at a very basic connect uh, to, at a human level on, you know, the importance of trees uh, and why they were kind of like central and, and what, they, what they did for not just the environment, but in, you know, creating a sense of community. And what, what the problem really is, and this kind of, you know, when we investigated further, like every road we were turning, this is another road where these, these three trees that had been here for 80, 80 plus years um, were also being cut down. And, you know, what we found the problem was, you know, you have uh, the ministry uh, developers, you can see this development in the back where um, what was a low density residential neighborhood is going through this massive, um, urbanization and increased density and developers um, and uh, Ministry of Works development in terms of rehabilitating roads are coming in and, you know, the first thing they're doing is not thinking about how these trees add to the aesthetics, but just basically cutting them down uh, to widen roads, uh, to allow access for high density, you know, luxury construction. And by, you know, by definition, changing the entire um, uh, landscape of the ecosystem and the environment. Um, I mean, this is another tree uh, that was within the vicinity. And I mean, it's, it's amazing because all of this was happening within a period of like one month where it, it, it seemed that because we were under lockdown, a lot of people, uh, government included, were using this as an excuse because people went out and, you know, uh, things could be done without visibility, uh, taking huge liberties and, you know, and, and just, so we kind of all came together and we decided to form an organization um, called the Tree Preservation Society. And, you know, like I said, it was, an, it was a natural response where a, a group of people within the community and extended community uh, decided to come together to see if this instant civic action and activism could actually um, uh, make, a, make a significant change. Please let me know when I've got like five minutes left. And so we, we got on a, on a group call with lots of residents, um, Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Works, Residents Association, and I made this presentation. Um, and luckily for us, uh, the, the, the governor of Lagos State happened to be on the call. And when we put our argument to him, he now um, gave a instruction uh, that, that the company that was doing the roads and the ministry uh, that had signed off on the removal felling of these trees should, should stop a work order. 
and they gave us about two weeks uh, uh, us to come together and come put together a proposal that uh, I guess would <laughs> I guess would do the work that should have been done beforehand. Um, and so, you know, we, we, we left this discussion with them making some recommendations about, you know, one of the things that needs to be done is, you know, there needs to be some sort of municipal mapping of the existing uh, tree canopy throughout, not just this area, but throughout Lagos. So there is a sort of a system of ordinance. Um, currently, there is actually a policy uh, that is monitored by Last Park, and I'll give you a really nice antidote to, to end this, that requires any uh, removal of felling of trees uh, uh, to require a permit, whether it's within your own property or on, on public property. That, the, the crazy thing was this, all of these trees that I was, we were highlighting in this initial um, conversation we're on we're on public roads so there are actually uh, trees being authorized to be cut down by the state uh, directly as part of their road expansion and you know we were given two weeks I think in the hope that we weren't going to be able to put something together and so again in this idea of kind of like collective effort uh, myself my office a whole group of landscape designers, um, or horticulturalists, uh, mostly in the private sector, and just concerned citizens spent like two weeks putting together a document to pre present to the government that I, I guess highlighted first and foremost the importance and the role of trees within the, uh, the wider context of the city, um, aimed to kind of present case studies to them, and, and at the same time, consider intermediate solutions and a sort of a way forward that may at some point help them develop their policy. Um, I, I think what is, is evident, evident from our research is that look, in the last 20 years, and this is just the Kuei area, I mean, there's been an unprecedented amount of like, tree felling and deforestation, and that, that has no global precedence. Um, if I had time, this we, we created this sort of um, digital mapping video uh, that, that looked at what had happened over since 2000, over the last 20 years. And it's quite scary to see how much, how many trees that have been cut down in this area. I think we're looking at deforestation, both in urban and um, rural areas in Nigeria is about 60% in the last 20 years, which is incomprehensible. So when we're thinking about things like problems of flooding or um, uh, like damaged ecosystems, you know, it's a direct result of, of things that we are doing in, in, in sort of our understanding of um, development. And this decrease is continuous. It's like, it's literally happening every day. Um, it's happening in the GRA area, you catch it right now. Um, a couple of days yesterday, um, I got a call because what we've tried to do with the uh, organization is try and, and get advocates and, and people uh, with eyes to, 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 to report to us if they see any trees being cut down. So yesterday, I mean, I'm not even not in Lagos. I got a message while I was on the plane um, from somebody who's registered to be a member of the society saying that they were on my Tamasule or Paolo Road and there's a tree there. Um, that I, I mean, that tree is so old. I, I'm not sure the exact age. It was starting to be cut down. And, you know, within like two hours of, you know, Gina reaching out to me, myself contacting Last Park, um, getting the details of, of the site, what exactly was happening using um, our phones, recording video and sending it to the agency, they were able to immediately identify that this person didn't have permission to do this and stop a work order. And, and it was amazing because in the space of like four hours, you know, we managed to stop what would have been a tragic event, which would have been the destruction of a tree that had been there for, uh, for, for decades. And I think, you know, one of the things, you know, I, 
I think it's really important that we all need to kind of like pay attention to is how, you know, one of the problems, and if you take this area of Ikoyi, for instance, which is supposed to be the highbrow area, what you're actually seeing is a lack of community or civic participation in, in the destruction of their environment, right? What, what we found through this, through this project in terms of analyzing uh, the processes that the Ministry of Work and Government were using to design and construct roads, what we found is that the process is at the, at the best um, rudimentary. And what I mean by that is they're basically creating singular sections, right? And applying those singular sections, like this section, for instance, right? And applying that sections, irregardless of what is there already. And the idea is, you know, the trees um, are, are sort of secondary to what they consider to be the primary uh, issue right now, which is to create, you know, accessible roads. I think what we were trying to argue with them, and what, you know, what we were trying to have a discussion with them is that, you know, through just a little bit of design and a little bit of like community participation, we could actually sort of create better roads and better streets and better environments that function for everyone. Because I think what people don't understand is the majority of Nigerians walk, like they don't have cars. So trees are actually fundamental in terms of how people are moving about the city, you know, how people are resting within the city. And this idea, which I think it's central to policy right now, the trees are secondary to sort of density growth, road development. Um, and unless as a community, we're able to sort of fight together to resist that, whether that's just visibly being on the lookout to see what, what illegal um, tree felling is happening, but also like as part of residence association, which people need to, you need to be part of your residence association. In this instance, we're talking about trees, but what the power of the residents association is huge because the government can't do anything unless it's passed through residents associations or local, you know, uh, local governments and participating in that process. You can actually hold up a lot of things. The reason we've got so far in this is because uh, Victoria Island Employee Residents uh, Association is directly behind, behind this. And you know, you'd be surprised the amount of power uh, the community uh, groups have um, when, 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 you, when you're able to support them. What I mean support them is, obviously we have technical expertise as designers and architects, you know, our, our willingness to, to do work for free, um, to, to ensure that uh, some of these issues that are gonna affect all of us. I mean, right now, I mean, this is, this is ironic, right, because the references I'm using is in the so-called highbrow uh, location, but we're actually thinking that, you know, if this is what's happening there, I mean, what chances do other rural, more rural communities have? Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm really going to kind of wrap it up there because I think I might have taken, taken a lot of time. So maybe when we are having a discussion, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to share some questions. I think what is really, important for everybody to think about is this idea of what is development and how does the, this, this idea of development, this is our own road now, right? And you think about like walking down this street. This street was not designed for people. This street was not designed for a sense of humanity. You know, there was no aspect of the street that, that, that was sort of interrogated to see that you know, and then there's so many people, so many businesses, individuals, organizations that, that exist on this road that do not part, that are not participating in this process. Um, same way with the renovation of Alfred Hawani Kingsway Road, um, where they cut down so many trees. Um, you know, you have all of these new high rise, high density developments, but you know, the nature of the environment and how it actually affects the people in public space um, is, is often ignored. Um, in, in favor of creating these like highly commercial neighborhoods. Um, and, and in this instance, or rather with this project, um, for us, it's really un important to understand that you know, on the very basic level, you know, trees provide natural comfort and, and, and it's free. You know, there is an equity. Uh, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, Papa, but um, you have about two minutes left.
No problem. I'm 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 just wrapping up. I'm just wrapping up. Um, so again, you know, uh, there's like 100 100 pages here, but I, I'll just wrap it up. So again, like I said, this is this is a project that that, that came about through um, a momentary um, uh, concern about what was happening in the neighborhood and expanding that to to interrogate like what is the processes that you know, local governments are actually using in terms of uh, developing roads and infrastructure that, that affect us and how does, how do those things affect our, um, our, our natural environment in green spaces. Um, I'm just going to leave it there. If you guys have any questions, please, please, please feel free to, to ask me at a later date. I'm just going to run through the slides just to show you some like before and after pictures. This is like before, this is after. So, uh, so we did all, we now started giving them proposals, ideas of what they could do. You know, you had all of these, I, I mean, if you go to some of these streets now, like none of these trees are there. Um, again, this is before, this is the same part after. Um, this is, um, this is before, this is after. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm done. Please, thank you. Thank you, Papa, for that presentation. Actually, the thing that jumped out to me was just how much work that you put into um, the presentations and the proposals that you've been doing. And I think most of us that have been following the campaign know how much momentum it picked up um, earlier earlier last year and even recently with the, um, with the tree that was illegally felled that you mentioned in your presentation. And I particularly like the comments you made about how it, it doesn't necessarily need to take public outrage or like a sudden burst of momentum for, I guess, for authorities to realize the benefit of community participation. As you've just highlighted, like there's so much to be gained from getting people to um, from getting people involved. And I also like your comment on how having strong residents associations um, is actually a huge driver because, well, we'll get to that later when we, um, when we get to the question stage, but um, in terms of actually having the voices there. So if there was some sort of call for part, um, community participation and involvement, how do you incentivize, incentivize people to um, participate in the process. So thank you very much for that presentation. And I look forward to the questions that um, I have and the guests have as well. And I'm sure lots of people have many questions. Um, so for now, we'll be moving on to um, Sarah's presentation. So if Sherrod, Sarah doesn't mind just sharing her screen with us. Hi, everyone. All right, good afternoon or good evening. Um, I don't think I am, I can't share my screen, my screen actually. Trying to, okay, I have a minute. Uh, a minute. Okay, a minute, please. I don't know what is happening or why I can't share my screen. Okay. Please let me know when you can see my screen. Yes, we can see it. It started the screen share. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, so good evening, everybody. Today I'll be talking about community participation and involvement. And I know there, there are a lot of things to share when, um, when this topic comes 
thumbs up, but I have 10 minutes, so I'm going to run through everything I decided to share with everyone here today. So first, I'll say thank you to the organizers for bringing me on board. I really do appreciate this opportunity. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, okay, I don't know why my screen is loading. Apologies for that, but it should catch up. So I'll just continue. Um, I wanted to start by saying my story. So at the moment, I know that when they were reading my bio, um, you all heard I'm a community organizer amongst so many other things, but I'm a lawyer. I'm a lawyer. And first, I wanted to answer the question why I went into community organizing, because many times when, okay, this screen is actually bothering me out. Because many times when, um, I'm talking about community organizing. I hear people ask me why I decided to do community organizing. So about three years ago, I was working in one of the noted most best law firms I can say in this country. But, and I was asked to, or my role there was actually to, um, to defend electoral laws. So I was literally the guys behind the politicians that we have today. And because sorry, I was aware I'm of the so political... sorry for interrupting you, Sarah, but um, is it okay yeah. if I share screen for you? Yes, please. It's okay. It's okay because this one is... Yes, it's okay if you share my screen. All right. Um, I'm on, like at the third slide. Okay, so um, I was defending those guys or drafting their claims and so on. And then I started to think that because when we have to defend it, this, I realized that, okay, these politicians that Hello, Sarah. We can't seem to hear Sarah clearly. Hello? Yeah, apologies, my net. So yeah, I decided to join Shift Nigeria and at Shift Nigeria, what we basically do is Okay, so when I was growing up, when I was growing up, yeah, I realized that there was something that happened when I was growing up. And in the estate I stayed at, this was like the way my street was when I was growing up. This was how my street was basically. And I remember my dad and a couple of other people on the streets decided to call like a meeting and said, oh, you guys, let's come together and actually fix our streets because um, we can't be doing, whenever it rains, our cars are getting bad, et cetera, et cetera. And all the plenty problems that would have probably come with having a street like this. And after that meeting, I know that if people did not really agree to do that. So I, everyone just started, okay, everyone just go and do your own drainage yourself. And my dad and very few people in the street did that. Until today, the street is still like this because they didn't agree 
to all do their journey when like when everyone could just do it so till today the streets still remains like this and i know that almost everyone um on this meeting can relate to something like this where there's a current problem in your community that has lingered for years that has lingered for like so long yeah and everyone just keeps go going about doing their own business everyone just tries to, oh in this in this community like this street this example something i faced while i was growing up our street is so messy but there's nothing we can do so i make my drainage the neighbor makes his or drainage but we still all still suffer suffer this problem at large so when i joined shifts nigeria um in going into different communities i realized that many communities many grassroots communities they are suffering from basic things like when i mean basic i mean so basic I think before I joined Shift Nigeria, I didn't know that some communities did not have water. It seemed it seemed very, very crazy. Like, I mean, water is so basic. That's a natural resource from God. How do people lack this? And it now made us say, okay, let's try to organize members of the community so they can um, come together to try to solve their problem. So I'm going to tell you about the Aliade community as a case study of work that we have done and how community involvement and engagement and participation has helped them solve a problem that has lingered for over 20 years and that has even killed people in the community. So the Aliade community is, please can you take me to the Aliade slide? The Aliade community is a community in Benue States. Um, I can't remember the amount of people they have there, but there are over 18,000 residents in that community. It is inside Benue State. Now, for over 20 years, like I mentioned, they had a problem. And what, what was the problem? They did not have water. It was when I went, when I visited the community, I mean, the first when we had had our um, meeting there and our I got the report that, okay, these people said the problem they're facing is they do not have water. It seemed very, very funny. But then when I visited the community myself, um, if you look at the then picture, you would see this little child going into a deep something. I don't know what that is, but trying to get water from that side. And you see people going around. This woman, her name is Florence, Madam Florence. She goes about, like, she stands up like 3 a.m. and just goes everywhere in the community to see if there are places like this to dig for them to get water. And there are other stories that I didn't put on this slide, but there are people that have lost their children, that we met someone that couldn't work at the moment because, of course, they don't even have money. There's no, there's no real healthcare center there, so they don't even have money to treat themselves if they fall sick. So the sickness just continues to linger and linger on in them. Now, the show they, 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 they was, we had a long-term plan for the community, which we was implementing at the moment. But the short-term plan was just, okay, this community, how many boreholes do we, do we think we can do? Three boreholes. But because we had a message that we wanted to promote the idea of community involvement and participation, and not just we just coming into the community to doing it for them, because from our research, that has plenty, plenty, um, disadvantages that I don't know if I can go into right now. So we decided, we, we had a meeting with members of the community and we told them, you guys have had this problem for over 20 years. We can do something about it. Boreholes can actually, we can dig a borehole and you can actually get water. This, 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 this. But we want everyone to contribute a little token so that this project is a community's project. And to my amazement, because I know that I have had something like this. I've, my father has been engaged in something like this growing up and it didn't work. But to my amazement, a whole community, they came together and they contributed money. They were contributing, contributing. It was a token, but it showed us how community engagement can, and involvement, everyone being involved in the community can change problems that the community they're facing. Now, this community, they have boreholes and they have access to water. They don't have to go to this, this other, they don't have to dig the ground like they do to get dirty water and drink it straight up. Now they have water um, that, even though it's a short-term plan, but with their involvement and participation, they've been able to access water. Next slide, please. 
Okay, next slide, please, before I come to the questions. Okay, so now this brings me to this quote that I heard one time and I should really change in my life. Social change does not need superheroes, it needs engaged communities. And what does this um, caption mean or this? What does this mean? It means that, you know, everyone in the pursuit of social change, we look up to people like, which is not bad, I must add, but we look up to people like Nelson Mandela, Rosa Park, um, who again would we look up to? But people that are iconic and they have led great movements and all of that. But you need, if you study their movements, you know that they had engaged communities. So instead of trying to be the Nelson Mandela and the Rosa Park and those iconic figures, with engaged communities in our country, in our nation, we can begin to see social change. With one community at a time, we can begin to see social change. And that's why a tagline has shaped really gets to me, which is we want to transform Nigeria one community at a time. Nigeria is really large, but Nigeria is made up of local government. Like Nigeria, when we look at Nigeria and the and the um, dream to change Nigeria, it seems really overwhelming. But when we start to see it as one community at a time, it begins to be more achievable. So social change doesn't need superheroes, it needs engaged communities. If you're in your community, how can you be engaged? How can you um, take the little problem that your community is facing and and try to see that it gets better or that it's being solved and resolved. Now, earlier in the slide, I was going to ask everyone to like list the problems their communities are facing at the moment. But because I have very short time, I don't know if I want to do so. I was going to say that you send you like just type one problem your community is facing at the moment. And I know that I know that um, every community you are facing something. Me, I'm in Abuja in where i stay there is something we are facing so it's something i want you to think about what problems are you facing in your community then i also asked the question also in this slide i said one do you know your local government chairman do you know your councillor? do you did you vote at the last by election did you even know when the by election was held if your answer is no i can safely assume that you think that the community problems are not your personal problems. And it might seem so at the moment, but with the way things are going on in this country, it is becoming evident and apparent that community problems are becoming our personal problems. So we need to be involved, we need to participate, and you need to participate in your local community. Like you have to start from somewhere. You have to start from your ward, your estate, your local government. For instance, I know I have friends be where I stay and in their estate they have like estate meeting estate association and in that place they vote they have they vote for the estate chairman and so on and this my friends to my greatest shock they don't get involved because ah oh, they will call for meeting on Saturday morning and I can't go for it I'm tired I'm doing something but you know that when those estate chairman and people they make decisions that everyone has to adhere to you start to cry about bad governance but you know that the problem started when you were not involved in the first place when you were not involved in the first place so um what i'm here to do today or what i decided i would do today was to um was to should i say tell you or inspire you to be more involved in your local government in your community and how can you be involved there are a million ways to do it there are a million ways to do it. please can you take me to the slide like my last slide no yeah, there are a million ways to do it, but I itemized this for. I said talk. Now, I know that when we hear the word talk, we just assume like everything that is happening on Twitter, just talking, talking, talking. No, I'm not saying you should do lazy talking, but you need to also, the first step to addressing any situation, the first step to any movement, any anything at all is actually to talk, not lazy talking, but you talk about talk about the problems, talk about the solutions, talk about how the solutions can be implemented. In Nigeria, we have a lot of people talking about the problems and I agree, it's time. When we talk about problems, talk about solutions, talk about how these solutions can be implemented. Don't be silent, in that your community, don't be silent. And then volunteer, I already mentioned it, volunteer to solve an issue in your community, sit down. What issue are, are we facing in the community? Is it that um, in this community is always very rowdy, there are no traffic lights, something, 
what issues are being faced in this community? Is it there is no water? Have we not seen light for four years? I know a place in this country that there has not been light for about five years in that place. So what's the issue? Volunteer to solve an issue. You might not, you can't even do it alone. So you need people. That's why I will go to the next point, teach and evangelize. So you should teach and sensitize others to also stand up for issues in your community. You can't do this thing alone. The change that you need, the earlier the community, the example I gave, one person couldn't do it alone. We had volunteers that led the movement in the community. Those volunteers couldn't do it alone. They had to teach and sensitize and get other people to buy into the movement. And finally, you need to organize. Now, presently, we have a lot of people agonizing everything that is going on in the situation. You have in your estates, people are agonizing. These streets are bad. These streets are bad. Um, the government, they are not doing this. And I'm not even excusing the government. That's not what I'm talking about now. But I'm talking about how instead of agonizing, you can organize to actually be the change you want to see. Form groups, um, form associations, have something in your estate where you guys sit down and look at how you can actually be involved in that community so that when decisions are being made you are there you are listening you are able to be a voice you are able to also contribute so you're not left with with um refraps. you're not left with incompetent people deciding how you live um finally please be involved in your community it would go a very very long way Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sarah, for that presentation. Um, I think just at the top of your presentation, I definitely related to the idea that there's a lot of mismanaged communication that then compounds issues that we have in our built environment and just in our cities in general. And um, just based off the work that SHIFT does, when we went to the Alia Day community, um, there was a community there, but you actually sort of implemented a system or a procedure that could make community, um, community participation easier. So I'm actually interested to know what level of baseline organization would be, could be introduced. So I think we'll tackle that later on in the questions. Um, and I really liked what you said about how social change doesn't need to be about superheroes. Like even in Lagos, we look at people and we expect them to transform our situation. And, you know, rather than looking at people and just admiring them for the hard work they do, I really liked your point about, you know, looking to systems and just playing your part. And if we all did that, then we will be contributing to a greater change. So just moving on to the questions, um, if any of the participants have any questions, you can put them in the chat box and we'll be going through them. Or if you're more comfortable, we can act, you can just unmute yourself and ask whichever, um, whichever speaker the question that you want to ask. So the first question on our side is to um, Papa. So for many projects, like, you know, the tree conservation project that you worked with and that's still currently ongoing, there's so many different players. And I know that in the community of Ikri that you work, that that project happened or spiraled from, um, maybe it's less of a variety, but there's still a lot of different players who all have different vested interests, despite them being part of the same community. So. How do you manage conflicting interests? Because I think a lot of people assume that just because you're part of the community, you all have the same mindset. How do you tackle that? Uh, I, you know, I, I, and I think this is the thing. And I, look, how I approach, how I work, honestly, is like, look, what do you care about? And, and what are you willing to do? Like, towards that thing, right? And I think what you now need to do is to figure out what is your expertise, right? And how do you use that expertise to share real knowledge? Like, and I, and I think for me, that's, that's how we try and carry people along, right? The government is saying to you that like, uh, okay, the reason that they didn't spend time designing something is because they don't have the capacity. You're like, oh, no problem, no, we'll do it for you, do it. 
you know, we're meeting the local chairman and the local chairman is telling us that like, yeah, yeah, you know, he's the one that uh, gave permission to, to, to do this because he wanted to do drainage. And you, and you know, so to sit him down and you tell him, they're like, well, actually, you know what? What the, folk, the reason that you have a problem in drainage is because like there's no policy that forces people to have, um, or people are not following the, the policy to have a minimum amount of vegetation in their compounds that soak up a lot of the water. So the water, everybody just hard escapes their compound. The water just flows onto the road. There's the, you know, the drainage systems can't cope. You know, and you just kind of like educate them in that. And, and so that's how I do it, right? I'm, I'm just here to be like, I'm an open source of knowledge. Like, what is your problem? How can I help you solve it? I think for me, it's, it's just that open hand. And I think that's what I always try and encourage people to just be, just be as transparent as possible. You know, let people know, because there is always a sense of like, what is your vested interest? Like, you know, and we're in Nigeria, so there's always a vested interest. You know, I'm, I'm telling you straight now, like whether we like it or not, whether it's a local chairman, you know, or whoever it is that is given permission or are supposed to do some of these things, there's a reason why they're not doing it. Right. So again, that the possible what community action does is is take takes away, you know, you take away that power from them, right? And you tell them they're like, actually, I have the power because I have knowledge, I have, you know, the physical labor, and I have the collective, you know, the collective might to to, to do something. Um, and, and I think that's how you get by it. And it's a long process, but let's 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 not kid ourselves right these a lot of things you know it takes time to move but what you need to do and, and i think sarah um pointed it is that it's really about creating visibility sharing knowledge and creating advocacy advocacy is so critical and advocacy that empowers people to now see somebody doing something and then feel that they can do it themselves Thank you very much for that answer, Papa. Um, yeah, education is extremely important. And even if people have vested interests, um, at least there may be a singular goal when they understand that they can actually satisfy their interests sustainably. Um, Alanda, you had your hand up. Yes, um, I wanted to ask a question. Can I ask one now? Yes, go ahead. Okay, great. Um, it's to both speakers. So um, Papa's kind of spoken about, I mean, he's really advocating directly to government. Um, and Sarah, Sarah has spoken about the projects that she's done within communities and really gotten communities to build their infrastructure. Um, and so, I mean, they're both very important, both, both ways of dealing with um, kind of large problems or, or things that the communities are lacking so much. Um, and Papa has made it sound very easy because it's, oh, you go to the local government and you know you, you, um, you share your knowledge or you, they say what their problems are and you share your knowledge. But not everyone has that um, access to local government or ministry staff or, or whatever. So my question is, how, how do you even get that like step in to advocate for such things, um, Papa? And also, and also for Sarah, the same question. Sarah, do you want to go first? Okay, yes, I can. Hi, hi Papa, thank you. Um, oh, hello, Lamdi. Okay, um, I think the question is, how do we get access for us to advocate for what we want to advocate about social change or whatever project you want to do? Am I right? Yes, exactly. So, I mean, but I'm thinking about not even just um, with communities, I mean, gathering the community and all of that, yeah. yes, but with, with oh, government officials you. so that you know, larger change can happen. Can happen, yes. So I, I, 
with the project I mentioned, you know, I did mention that the, this was a short term plan and we had a long term or we are doing a long or implementing a long term plan that I didn't talk about. Yeah. And that involved government officials, too. Um, but for for me, I don't know about them, but for me, when we were going to work with the local governments in that community or the local government representing that community, we didn't have we didn't have um, any prior relationship. Yeah, we went there personally to talk about what we've seen, the problems we've seen, and how we think it can be implemented. And we all, we also, I think we also tried to hear. Yeah, oh, they also told us, oh, they've been planning to do it, but they told us there are there are problems, there are challenges, and we're like, oh, we can step in to help if this is the problem that you're facing. So it wasn't any hassle, so to speak. We just went there to actually talk to them. Yeah. And I think that if you actually have the will, so I know that in Nigeria, ministries, local governments and government offices, they can be a bit tiring to get into and to, to talk to someone in there. But I think that there is always a way basically if so, for instance, if we could not get access to the local government person or something, we would have used like the chief of the community that we're, we were in to get access. So we could have used somebody to actually get access. But what I'm just trying to say is that there is always a will. And when there's a will, there is a will basically. Um, uh, yeah, so look, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not gonna sit here and not say that like, you know, my interventions come to agree from, you know, a certain degree of privilege, right? In terms of access. But what I do believe 100% is that, look, we're moving towards, or rather I believe in a decentralized system, right? And I, and I, and I really do think that like how communities and neighborhoods, you know, create their own infrastructure and, and empower themselves is the only way forward. But I also see that being connected to a wider network, right? And what I mean by wider network is that there is, there is there is visibility now of people that may have similar challenges than you outside of your community that I think it's important um, to, 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 to recognize as, as a starting point. And obviously, yes, like um, even to, to know that there is that option requires some degree of education and engagement. You know, I'm from Mijabo Day, right? And my 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 brother does a lot of work there right and for instance i'm trying to do a project there um on a farm that looks at sustainability and the first thing we did is we tapped into the resource of the like the zakat foundation that he's a member of that deals predominantly with um uh, uh islamic women in the community and how to empower them and through that connection led us to another organization and another community group. So I think, you know, understanding that as an individual, it's going to be very difficult, but finding a way to connect with uh, organizations or network that may give you more access. Um, of, again, obviously, to even do that, there needs to be a degree of negotiation. But I I, I guess that's why I'm a believer that, look, as all the people on this call, as professionals, right, there, there is a duty, you know, for, for us to assist um, with community development or engagement um, at, at, at a small and a wider level um, that allows uh, all communities to now be able to engage themselves at, at the next level, whether that's a local government, that's at state, and then even at the bigger level of, of federal. So it's it's really just this building of um, of, of networks that uh, that may start on your street, but then expand um, uh, to to other organizations and networks uh, having the same issues or working towards the same goals that uh, you're aiming for. Sorry, just sorry. I don't, I don't want to take away from anybody else's question, but I think some of the things that you both said were really uh, quite key. If you're thinking about like how do we how do we strengthen community communities or strengthen or empower communities? 
So, I mean, what you were saying about strength in numbers and creating networks. Um, and Sarah, also the idea of like bringing technical, both of you actually, you know, having technical people as well within those networks can be quite important. Um, so yeah, really great, really great. I feel like a paper needs to be written on this because, <laughs> because it's some, I think a lot of people want to know how to um, somewhat push government to do better, but they don't know how. And this is one way that um, it can be done. So I, I think, yeah, maybe this is really, really good. Okay, great, I'm gonna stop now. Thank you, Olamide, for that. And actually, just for anybody on the call, Olamide is actually quite the writer. So I think she'll be able to do a fantastic job on writing our proposal. And that was exactly my thoughts. Um, my next question, just pivoting off that, is to Sarah, that how, how do we actually, con how do we build a system? So not necessarily convincing people that we want to have community participation as the norm, or even, or not even necessarily having connections, but how do we build a system where this is just the case? Okay, like a system where um, everyone is just involved in their community, right? Yes, yeah, so even based off what Papa said earlier, how he feels like we're moving towards a more decentralized government, a community led decision making mm -hmm. process. Okay, um, so first, I think it will take time because it's a lot of mind shifting in Nigeria currently. So there are people that are not involved in their communities and they don't think they should be. They feel like if I can provide generator for my house, even if my, the frontage of my house is good, I can clear my own dirt, um, I can build my house, fence my, like, I don't need you guys. I can employ my security. I don't need you guys. But it is actually very wrong. That mindset is wrong. And I think it's going to take a lot of mind shift. So for instance, when what we did at Aliade Community, it took us a lot to talk to now it's it's a success story for us because we are even um replicating the model we use in the community in another community in edo state as i'm speaking to you but it took us a lot at first to talk to people to see why they, they should even contribute money to do what is necessary for them so i think that um a lot of sensitization will work um sensitization pointing out the importance of community participation. So when people see how something will be of value to them, I believe they will buy into it. It might take time, but when you convince them, convince them and show them how valuable this thing you're saying would affect the community and affect them personally, because a lot of people think community is not personal, but I strongly believe that community problems can be your personal problems too. So when people see it in that manner, they would eventually buy into it. But sensitization, consistent sensitization, um, consistently teaching people. And I think that one, one method that we use in the Aledi community is that when we are able to teach maybe a small sect of people, we put those people like, we put them as, um, evangelist so to say we use that, that word exactly evangelist so they are also meant to go and teach other people to what we are telling them so um sensitization just sensitization of the importance of people participating in communities and i think that this sensitization should even start like asa because like you said and like papa mentioned that as you're, as you're looking at the nation the nation is tilting towards a more decentralized nation and we would prosper better when we understand to be more involved in our communities. Yeah, I, hope I, I just want to add, yeah, yeah sir. Okay. I just wanted to add something to what Sarah was saying. Look, I'm going to give you an example, right? So during, like, we all know what happened last year and the NSARS and what happened afterwards, right? So, you know, again, it, like we were in our office, we were like a lot of, a lot of, um, people, uh, our team, were just like, look, what can we do? And we set up something called Citizens Rebuild, right? And the idea was really, really simple. It's like, how do we, and I think for us, 
like what is central is working with communities is to create open source information. And what I mean by that is we're creating all of us, every single one of us should have models that are accessible to everybody, right? So somebody's like, oh, I want to do this. They should be able to find that information of how it's been done somewhere else and be able to apply it in their community. Maybe adjust it a little bit, but that's what we should do. We should move away from this idea of um, hoarding information or hoarding access to knowledge. So Citizen Rebuild was a really simple idea. It's like, look, you have all of these people that have been affected by NSTARS, a lot of people working in charities and NGOs or even like young entrepreneurs whose businesses have been destroyed. Like, can we create a network, like an open source platform where we can get all the people that we know that have some kind of expertise and also open call for anybody who's been affected by NSARS and figure how they could just share information and resources, right? It wasn't financial, it was just like, look, I can help you do something, all right? Um, and then from that, somebody started sending money to, 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 to this uh, little idea, like people from America or like even here in Nigeria, and we raised huge amounts of money, right? And we were now able to connect that money to people working within public sector and charities that had maybe vandalism as a result of NSARS. And then the expertise of like private or knowledgeable people that, that gave them pro bono help in order for them to sort of reassert their businesses, you know, that operated within particular uh, communities. I think this is the thinking that we all need to have and we all need to apply both at micro, micro and macro levels. There has to be like, and it, and, it, and it shouldn't be like, you know, I always say to people that we should be aiming to make these models the norm. They shouldn't be special cases. It should be constantly available. Um, communities, wherever you are in Nigeria, individuals within communities, within neighborhoods, should be able to have access to uh, templates and knowledge that has been used successively everywhere else that they can gravitate as a starting point. Um, and I think it's figuring out amongst, you know, participants on this call, Ludi obviously does a, a, a great job, figuring out how to make all of, all of this knowledge more and more open uh, for people to be able to connect to. Because, you know, we know this, knowledge is power. Like, you know, Sarah said something in the beginning where, you know, even her initial engagement of like communities without water was eye-opening. She didn't realize that there were communities that didn't have water. So I, I, I think we don't have to wait to discover that this knowledge should just be available for people to, 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 to have access to. Um, thank you for that. Um, Ying, can you put your hand up? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Yimika. Uh, thank you, and thanks to all the speakers. I, um, yeah, it's been really uh, resourceful, really. Everyone has been very resourceful. Now, uh, just to uh, buttress what Papa said, I was actually having that, I mean, I had in mind to raise the issue of having a template that could actually be applied or ad ad adapted to uh, different uh, communities. I think it would be very, very important if that could happen. And um, really, I, I also uh, want community in Lagos because I think um, the cases that have been mentioned, I mean, the one Papa mentioned, one Sarah mentioned, actually, I think they are just the outliers. They are just the exceptions. What's actually available generally, especially in Lagos, is where you have an unstructured um, and highly politicized uh, CDAs and CDCs where people just uh, kind of uh, get involved for, I mean, for, I mean, whatever they could get out of it. And actually, because I was actually, I was at um, a local government long, not long ago, and I, there was a meeting of the CDA, and it was actually about politics. All that they were discussing were just politics, I mean, the election and things like that. So I think uh, uh, it should go beyond that. And um, yeah, there's need for, a change in perspective, a change in our 
approach. And um, I think um, I, I, what a, a commission also came to mind, I mean, during this whole discussion, and that is the Woroshoki uh, community. I think there we have different uh, approaches, really, uh, cohabiting. There are the CDAs or the CDCs, as the case may be, that are highly politicized by the people, I mean, by the, uh, the, the, uh, the older people, the older generation. And there is actually another uh, level of uh, people, community people, that's the youth, and they're actually doing quite a bit and, I mean, very, very progressive in their approach. And, uh, yeah, there is actually uh, conflict. There's often conflict between these two or frictions between these two groups. Uh, the older ones, they want the politics, they want the, I mean, whatever they can, they can get from it, uh, versus this new or this younger generation of youth, of young people who are very progressive. And you can, it's actually amazing to see uh, the level of And uh, you see, uh, for example, they have a database of virtually all the residents in that community. These are things that are not even available for the government or are not available yet for the government. The local government does not have that, uh, that uh, 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 resource. The state does not even have that. But the youth, young people, they kind of come together. Like somebody said, uh, he said, I mean, the, the development has when people first come together and they get organized and they get creative and they scale up. So, I mean, this young people they came together, they, 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 they call themselves the they, 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 they Joker of in the map that are not available in the in, in the corridor of, uh, of the government. So I think, um, yeah, going back to the to, to, to the point, uh, which is the fact that I mean, uh, there's need for a template. I mean, there's need for a template so that I mean, I mean, uh, uh, for people that I mean, I mean, that could actually allow people to kind of uh, yes, it's been done somewhere else, it's been done here, it's been done there, but I mean, uh, 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 to allow for easy adoption of such a uh, working process as the case may be. I mean, there, there might be need for uh, uh, someone or an organization or, uh, uh, yeah, an organization to kind of coordinate and kind of bring together these resources for other people to tap into. Uh, yeah, I think that's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Denka, for that contribution. Um, do we have any other questions from our speakers or from our guests, rather? Just feel free to unmute. I would like to ask the participants a question. Like, okay, go what, ahead, Papa. What does everybody think are, are the, the most pressing issues that stop this sense of shared commons, like this, you know, what, what, what does everybody feel is the main barrier to um, uh, like big communities being more empowered and stronger? It'd be interesting to know what everybody's thoughts on that. What is the main, what do they consider to be the main barrier? Because there does seem to be a barrier. I think personally, I will go first. So for me personally, it just seems, I don't think there are that many stories out there in terms of, you know, community, community participation. Well, obviously there, there are stories out there, but a lot of the time they sort of seem unattainable or attainable only if you have, um, and I know we've spoken about this in the call, or only attainable if you have a certain level of connection. And a part of me also feels like a lot of people feel, just like as Sarah mentioned, a lot of people feel like they, they shouldn't be the ones to do this or they don't think that they're good enough to, to be a part of the process. Um, yeah, 
So Nishi, as Miriam just said in the group chat, I think there's an underlying identity crisis, Nishi. Um, Yumika, you might just call people out so they can just answer. I think that's probably best. Yeah, so Miriam, what do you think? Hi, guys. I just want to say that there are many mirrors on the call. Maybe everybody should change their names because <laughs> people use my name to join. But what I wanted to say about community, oh, kind of what Yumika said, a lot of people think that it's not in their place. For example, where I live, I don't think anybody's really bothered. Everybody's expecting the local government or some sort of the ballet or something to take charge and say, oh, let's do this before anybody. Everybody's just waiting for somebody to start it before they come, they go on board. Yeah, so that's what I want. So I want the question again. I didn't quite catch the question. So I was just asking, what, what does everybody feel is the main barrier to more community um, participation? I'm sorry, I didn't realize my name was saved as um, Miriam. Um, I joined the conversation quite late, but I listened to a bit of what um, Sarah said, um, but I, 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 with regard to Papa's question about barriers to um, community participation, I don't know, can you hear me? Okay. Um, yeah, we can hear you. So I, I think that there is a deep identity crisis you know, in, in our society where um, people, ha I mean, people are not aware even about this identity crisis. And I think it is, you can trace it back to the effect of colonial, colonization. Um, but for example, I'm doing a study on a community, uh, Ajegunle community, and Ajegunle is a community where there are so many ethnic groups. There's so many, uh, there's so much diversity of ethnic groups, and they have a history of getting along together, but then within that history of getting along with one another, there is also, there are also deep scars of ethnic prejudice. So I think by the time we eventually, I don't know how we're going to come to this, um, you know, homogeneous state or unity. I think until then, there will always be um, this challenge for community participation. Yeah, hello. I mean, I think uh, for me, yeah, I think I quite agree with uh, what was said. There is a huge identity crisis in the in, in our society in really, general. And um, yeah, I always ask myself this question: so Are we really communal in Nigeria, or I mean, to bring it home in Lagos? I mean, uh, we used to have. I mean, society we. And where I mean we, we all came from actually used to be I mean back in the days used to be very very communal. I am Yoruba. I know the traditional Yoruba setting, the Agboli kind of setting where you have uh, family houses all in one compound and everybody does things uh, together and you know. But I think we have lost that. I mean a long time we've lost that. I don't know if uh, the kind of education that we had. Or that we are, we have, no, we are exposed to now. Kind of um, took that away from us. 
uh, or I mean, what we call civility or civilization now. I mean, it's everybody just remaining in his own house. You know, I don't, I mean, don't cross your line. Everybody is within these high fences. And I mean, no interaction. To interact with your neighbor, it's like you are keeping low or you are not civilized. You know, you just mind your business. And that kind of mindset is, is really, really killing us. It's really, really killing us. For example, in my community, I live in a small estate in Ikoju, and um, it's amazing how people live. Uh, everybody has this, uh, uh, you know, uh, this same approach. Uh, even within the CDA, there's this class thing. There is this, oh, I don't want to interfere. I don't want to get involved. I don't want to because I have my own class. I can build. I can have my, my generator. I can have, imagine people, they mean to buy a, what's it called transformer now has become like competition there are like two three co i mean transformers in my in the little in the little uh what's it called little estate I'm, I'm, because everybody was just sure and you know it's not really uh, these are people are supposed to be educated and learned and i mean exposed you know i i, I was opportune to travel one time and i was in a village somewhere in uh in in in, in Scotland. This was a village, a remote village. But the way they live, it was very, very communal. Everybody, everybody is comfortable. But they come together, they have events together and things like that. But we long lost uh, 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 such kind of, uh, of 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 life as it were. We everybody has now like uh, uh, withdraw. I mean, everybody had, had withdrawn into its own uh, uh, me myself and mine kind of uh, life. I think it. Perhaps because of the kind of uh, uh, yeah identity crisis, and also because of the kind of, uh, of of I mean what I exposed to in terms of education, really we don't really have proper proper education as it way. I think uh, that's just my thing. Thank you. Thank you, um, Yinka. So we have a comment from a Miriam Adenuga, and I don't know which Miriam this is. Just to the question, it says, solving problems just seems bleak, especially in Nigeria. I know we agree to start, I know we agree to start small and help as much as we can, but I often think about helping in the way I can and I get exhausted. Where do we start from? It seems so overwhelming and it feels as though if you start, how much ground can you can one even cover? This is not about apathy. So many people want to help, but how, where? The Nigerian factor plays a part. It's so overwhelming. Yeah, so we've been hammering on about this throughout the whole um, today's conversation. It's really difficult. It's a lot of hard work. And as the system is built, it's not easy. Um, but Papa made some really good comments about having, like, having some sort of templates that people can follow, sharing knowledge so that the burden of having to innovate is, is not so much. And Sarah um, raised some good points about how it's not just about talking. Sometimes you actually have to, you know, grab, maybe it's difficult. And even though you don't cover that much ground, just have a conversation and see where that goes. At the end of the day, I think that's, I'm pretty sure that's how the Tree Preservation Society really kicked off their efforts. efforts. Papa, please just correct me if I'm wrong. But it really just started with a dialogue and we know that how that ended. Um, or how it's going and it has a lot of impact. So, um, yeah, I'll just ask, yes, I'll, I was just going to ask Olamide if she wanted to unmute. Yeah, no, I thought you were closing, Yimika. I'm so sorry. You can close. I can yeah. just write my comments in the chat. It was just answering Papa's question. Oh, no, go ahead. I think. We can squeeze in just a quick answer and then we'll round up the conversation. Okay, all right, great. Sorry, my son is also in the background. I think everyone is used to me uh, having him in the background. So, um, yeah, so basically I was just going to say that since military rule, I believe that people have realized that they don't have the power to make change anymore. I think that's basically what stifled our uh, the idea of community in Nigeria. So I, so I mean, for me, I feel it's just that. It's just that we went from uh, somewhat colonialism and then went from democracy and well, somewhat democracy, went to military, 
And I think since that point, um, our, our sense of community or our sense of is it belonging or a sense of um, like we can actually make change ourselves um, has, has gone. So we need to somewhat rebuild that, that um, sense. Uh, and, I, and I think things like, I mean, what all the projects that people are doing are absolutely fantastic. Um, and I, but I also believe that big movements, like for example, the NSARS movement um, and, and other like large movements start to make some of these um, realities, like people start to think, oh, actually change can happen. Actually people can make change. Um, but we just have to keep working at it, I guess. Oh. Yeah, that's my answer to Papa's question. And thank you very much, Alamdi, for that. Yeah, I, I... I don't know if we want to close so early, but I wanted to ask a question. Is that okay? Or we're closing now? Um, but is it to one of the speakers? Um, no, tech, no, not really. <laughs> Just a general <laughs> question, but maybe we can discuss it afterwards, I'm sure. Well, I think we can post it on the, if you can put a conversation on the chat and then we can see how we can follow from there. Or okay. if you want to ask like a, a specific speaker the question, Okay, no, no problem. Um, I would probably get the question across. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bussy. Honestly, thank you. Thank you to everyone who has participated in this conversation. It's really been insightful. Um, like this particular Mira Madinga said, you know, things do seem bleak. And I don't think this is just a Nigerian problem. I think that this is just a developing country's thing, you know, but we have, we've got what we've got and illiteracy on the side of many and also poverty attributed to this. Yeah, sorry for that. This is Adewumi Igwe, literacy on the side of many and poverty attributed to this. So <laughs> just kind of interrupting the closing of the talk. I think this is a really good point. I think this is a really good point um, because I think a lot of people also talk about education and lack of quality education and how that can affect community participation. But let's not segue too much. Um, Papa and Sarah, would you guys like to share last remarks? Um, Sarah, you can go first. Hi, I see my network. I didn't hear you. What was it? What, what am I supposed to say to you? I'm um, just last comments. Last words? Yes. Hello, Sarah. The network isn't so great. Maybe Papa should go first. Yeah, Papa. Yeah, okay, sure. I mean, I guess my last word is that look, we, we all need to figure out how to actively um, in, uh, ways and processes that we can empower communities. I think it's good to start with things that you're passionate about. But I think it's important to extend that to offering whatever kind of skills or knowledge or information you have to what other people may be passionate about or what other things may be important in communities near, near you or that you um, have knowledge of. Um, and, and for me, is I always say, look, if anybody has any, anything that they feel that we can assist or share knowledge knowledge about, please let me know. But uh, thank you all for your questions and thank you for the Bridge Series. It's always so, so great what you guys are doing and um, thank you for inviting me. 
Um, thank you to both our speakers for just being here and sharing with us. It was really, really insightful. Um, so on that note, we'll just close the bridge series. And I think I'll just leave with a couple words of just... Um, sorry, I think Sarah is back. Okay, Sarah. Yes, I do not get what you want. Sarah, we were just hoping that you could share some last comments before we close the bridge series. Yeah, I don't think I don't think um, we have Sarah with us anymore. Her network seems quite bad. So on that note, um, we'll just close the bridge series. And I think just a couple things before we part is there's some key ideas that we've come away from this. Firstly, the idea of the template. So producing knowledge that can be replicated is very interesting. And then I think we also just need to be thinking of how do we want our communities to look like and on that note, thank you to all us, to both our speakers who have participated and been very, very, um, have shared a lot of insightful work that they've done. Thank you to the participants who um, joined us and hopefully we'll be able to reconvene in another bridge series. Bye. Bye bye. Have a good evening, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank Bye. you, Papa. Thank you, Sarah. Bye, everyone. And we will have the video. Bye. Bye.